<laughs> okay, folks. Uh, welcome, and I'm going to take a minute and introduce our speaker for today, uh, Professor Jens Meyer Henrik. Uh, teaches at Harvard. He is uh, formerly a Rhodes Scholar and a prolific and award-winning author. Uh, his work has been published by the most prestigious presses. His most recent book, The Legacies of Law, Long-Run Consequences of Legal Development in South Africa, won the American Political Science Association's 2009 Woodrow Wilson Foundation Award for the best <coughs> book published in the United States during the previous year on government, politics, or international affairs. That's certainly not a small category, and that's quite a big prize. He's currently completing additional work on the topic of genocide on a trilogy that was forthcoming from Princeton University Press and a variety of other monographs, publications, and journal pieces. In addition to being a very well-published academic, he also knows what he's doing. He's had the opportunity to work in the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the opportunity to work at the International Criminal Court with the Chief Prosecutor. He spent considerable time on the ground in a multiplicity of conflict zones, including Rwanda, which will be the focus of his presentation today. In addition to all of these other things, he's also, most importantly, a very nice person, which is not necessarily a norm in the academic world. He's generous with his time, kind with his words, and let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Professor Drumbo, for those extremely kind words. I certainly appreciate them very much. Uh, we start by saying it's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to present my work, and um, I've had many interesting, wonderful conversations already at Washington Lee, and I look forward to continuing um, this exchange today with you. My talk for today is entitled Lawfare, the Formation and Deformation of Gachacha Jurisdictions in Rwanda, 1994-2000. I'll be concerned with the theory and practice of what I call lawfare uh, and its relationship to the international administration of democracy and development. My talk and the forthcoming book from which it is drawn is about the legal origins of dictatorship in post-genocide Rwanda. Um, and just to, to give a little bit of a background, and it's often not necessarily conveyed in popular accounts of post-genocide Rwanda, there is an authoritarian regime. Um, some have called it a constitutional dictatorship, some just a pure dictatorship. Uh, and this is very, very difficult to understand um, if we are to make inroads into this complex topic of transitional justice as well. And I'll be elaborating uh, on the nature of this authoritarian regime as I go along today. So through the lens of this frequently misunderstood case, I develop an argument about the systematic use and abuse of legal procedure for political ends. My talk is meant to complexify the meaning of the rule of law as well as the case for its promotion. Although the concept of the rule of law is invariably involved in debates about democracy systems and development aid, it is frequently mis uh, misinterpreted in both scholarship and practice. This is so because the so-called rule of law sector, which organizations such as the World Bank, the UN, USAID, inhabit, the institution of law is seen as technology when it should be seen as sociology or politics. Like taking this insight as my starting point, I focus in my talk on the political economy of law, by which I mean the roles and consequences of strategic choice in legal development. I'll be speaking a great deal about the dark sides of virtue, to borrow a phrase from David Kennedy. Kennedy recently called for a wholesale reassessment of the principles and practices of international humanitarianism. I know that many of you have an interest um, in this particular um, line of work. And, and he described um, this field as, quote, a Gordian knot of participation in power and denial, <clears throat> a willful blindness posing a strategic insight. So it's, it's quite an indictment of much of what international humanitarian um, practice has been all about. Like Kennedy, I'm intent on laying bare and contributing to transcending the limits of international humanitarianism, with particular reference to the province of transitional justice, um, this ever more important arena um, in the international rule of law sector. 
I show, among other things, um, how international support for rule of law projects, and I really mean the rule of law, I'll talk about this more later, um, how such support can unwittingly stall transitions from authoritarian rule and serve as a catalyst in transitions to authoritarian rule. Now, this finding is of both theoretical and, and practical significance. In theoretical terms, it speaks to debates about the rule of law as an essentially contested concept, um, and debate with which some of you may be familiar. familiar. Um, furthermore, it poses the question as to whether E.P. Thompson's description, and he was a British and Marxist historian, whether his description of the rule of law as an unqualified human good is theoretically plausible and empirically verifiable. It also speaks to the burgeoning literature uh, across many different imperial contexts of judicial the judicialization of politics. This is a debate we've been having in the US for, for years as well. Um, in practical terms, the finding raises questions about the great expectations that have, for better or for worse, become associated with rule of law projects. The UN, as you probably know, alone has poured millions of US dollars into such projects in the last 10 years, notably by including the task of strengthening the rule of law um, in the mandate of UN peacekeeping operations. Now, when approached and understood in this way, um, strengthening the rule of law is a technical, practically scientific task. And this is something I take issue with. And I think this, is the, of, this, this, this uh, debate about the technology of, of law is of immediate relevance for its promotion abroad. Now, even in the most peaceful, stable societies, it is extraordinarily difficult to translate the rule of law from abstract, idealistic notions into concrete, practical outcomes. So I'm not suggesting exporting it um, is to be um, frowned upon. I think this is a really good idea. But I think the manner in which often uh, individuals, groups, organizations, countries, states go about it um, has to be often called into question. Um, as you can imagine, the degree of difficulty is even higher in post-conflict environments, the ones that I usually study. Um, so my goal, therefore, is to have us rethink, before its export, the promise and limits of the rule of law. And in particular, I demonstrate how the rule of law can be reconfigured as a political weapon and how the international community can end up aiding and abetting its use. And to make my case, I detail the mechanisms and processes of the strategic use of this weapon, what I call lawfare, in a telling case. And my talk for today is organized as follows. I'll be talking first um, about legal contention as a domain to be explored in more depth. I'll then define um, this concept of lawfare and distinguish a number of subtypes, and there I'll illustrate that the argument I'm trying to put forth um, may have uh, validity above and beyond the case of Rwanda. So if you're not a Rwanda expert or have particular interest in that region of the world, uh, hopefully you'll also um, uh, uh, enjoy some benefits uh, of my remarks today. I will then talk um, or, or uh, take you through the transition from lawmaking to lawfare in Rwanda um, and sort of how in particular these Gachacha jurisdictions, which I will explain in a moment, uh, have come to um, resemble a tool of social control and domination as opposed to a mechanism of transitional justice as we I tend to think about it. I then fourthly talk about uh, the rise of this particular strategy, what explains the turn to lawfare as, as I see it. And then I conclude um, um, with some responses or answers, tentative answers to the question as to whether or not the rule of law is really exportable. In 1994, the landlocked, impoverished country of Rwanda was the site of genocide. Incited by elements within their government, Hutu soldiers, militia, and ordinary peasants roamed the countryside for three months with the intent to destroy and hold on part the Tutsi ethnic group as such. The genocide left Rwanda in ruins. As one observer put it, Rwanda was not just a country full of skeletons, it was a skeleton of itself. Entire villages were destroyed, government offices looted and trashed, nearly 80% of the country's cattle were stolen or slain, fields left unattended or burned. There was no working water, electrical power, or telephone system everywhere in churches, <coughs> schools, hospitals, guards, latrines. They lay bodies amid millions of accompanying flights. 100 days of slaughter had not only resulted in the death of society, but in the death of the state as well. In 2002, the then government of national unity, led by the Rwandan Patriotic Front, the RPF, inaugurated so-called gachacha jurisdictions in an attempt to come to terms with all but the most serious crimes committed in the course of the 1994 genocide. 
In 2009, um, these jurisdictions drew to a close, with few exceptions, um, allowing for a preliminary analysis of their nature and consequences. On one level, the invention of the Gachacha jurisdictions represented an innovative attempt by the Tutsilet government to respond to the legacies of the genocide, which claimed the lives of more than 500,000, perhaps as many as 1 million lives. Um, it was a daring experiment in transitional justice. Consider the following statistics. Rwanda's experiment involved more than 12,000 jurisdictions, over 1 million defendants, nearly 170,000 judges, and some 8 million ordinary Rwandans who formed thousands of court assemblies mainly <coughs> in the countryside. For the first time ever in history was an entire population involved in the adjudication of genocide. And if we believe official statistics, and we may not, the Gachacha jurisdiction had rendered 1.1 million judgments by April of last year. 1.1 million judgments. Now, the enormity of this institutional choice is even more apparent if you compare it to one of the most lauded responses to human rights atrocities, South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which pales in size and scope and considered alongside the Vetchacha jurisdictions. Oh, sorry, I should have put this up earlier. Um, I apologize. So here get the figures again. And here is South Africa. Um, the TSC, as interesting and important as it, um, as it has been, was operational for only three years, divided its work among three committees, employed 17 commissioners, convened 50 hearings, disposing of 21,000 cases. Now, as far as we know, the idea of Gachacha, originally described as an, uh, described an informal method of dispute resolution, used in a variety of guises to settle civil disputes over property rights, family matters, and other community affairs. In the wake of the genocide, the interim government recast what had become known as Gachacha into a formal method of dispute resolution. And over the course of the last several years, the organizational structure of these jurisdictions changed several times. And here you actually see the various levels at which they initially uh, were operating, the cell, the sector, at the district level, um, to give you an idea of, of how the, the country was governed uh, administratively. Um, they are recognized as full-fledged judicial institutions under Rwandan law. So these are not traditional institutions at all. You know, the government, while admitting that these are quasi-judicial or quasi-traditional, um, does receive a lot of credit, credit for having turned to traditional justice for coming to terms with genocide. I submit uh, this simply is not the case. These are just ordinary courts that um, are fully functioning as judicial institutions in Rwanda. Um, this is the uh, structure uh, of one of these jurisdictions at the cell level, um, according to the 2002 organic law, which um, um, revised um, their cell. Level. Um, at their inception, they were organized, uh, as I mentioned, in a hierarchy of four levels, coinciding with the territorial organization of the country. Um, the courts at the district and provincial levels were later abolished because it seemed to be too cumbersome an administrative task to running them. Um, but aside from that, each Kachacha court had, had uh, certainly three organs. Um, namely a general assembly, uh, a panel of judges, and a coordinating committee. Uh, initially, the bench uh, was comprised of 19 persons of integrity, Inyanga Mugadio and Inyang Rwanda. Later, this number uh, was reduced to, um, to nine because it turned out that judges simply weren't showing up, and even the coercive nature of the Rwandan state wasn't sufficient um, to achieve compliance. Um, the assembly, as you can see, uh, is constituted by all residents, or was constituted by all residents of the cell. The cell is the lowest administrative unit, ranging in size between about 100 and, and 400 persons on average, I would say. And everyone older than 18 years old was part of this assembly. Um, here you'll see a couple of images from the um, uh, cells in Gishambu. This is a site where I began my research in 2002, as I said, when the um, the first, if you will, um, trial phase, or project phase, I should say, uh, got underway in Rwanda. Um, so we spent two months here uh, looking at three different uh, cells, um, doing ethnographic research, basically, trying to understand what these institutions uh, just formed, really meant to people on the ground, how they functioned, to really work as participant observers. So we went every day uh, observing proceedings, um, and, and interviewing people and trying to get a sense of, um, of what this institution really meant. And this is, these images are simply meant to give you an idea of the setting. This was just market day on a Sunday. Um, 
And, and so I'm, a, I'm a, a, a strong believer in anthropological work on legal institutions, whether they are domestic <laughs> or international. I also do this kind of work in international courts and tribunals. For as Jumble mentioned, I work at the ICDY and ICC. My reason for going there and, and working in, in chambers in particular was to appreciate from the inside out the dynamics um, of adjudication, the choices that justices make. And I think lawyers as well as the scientists are not usually um, accustomed to working in this way and by so doing, by so sort of ignoring these internal, uh, what some have called the social lives of tribunals. I think we, we, we miss a great deal of, of importance when we describe and, and try to make sense of these, these kinds of courts. So this is uh, the setting, this is like yeah, the market day. Um, so this is the kind of setting in which many of these jurisdictions would have taken place. In the countryside, this is one of the poorest countries in the world still today. This is a brick-making facility. Brick-making being one of the, if you want to call it that, industries in Rwanda. Um, sort of this is, to give you a sense of uh, the poverty and, and such we're dealing with. This, for example, was the, um, the cha means in Kenya, Rwanda, uh, loosely translated justice on the grass, right? This was one of these court settings that we, that we studied in 2002, and then uh, I went back after as well. At that point in time, uh, and still today, although it's easier today, you're not allowed to take any photographs um, of proceedings in session. If you're a photographer for Vogue and other such superficial magazines, you were given this. If you're a researcher, there was a great deal of concern that you might actually do something harmful with that, right? So the government was very interested in marketing this idea. Uh, but actually, if you were an academic, they were very reluctant to, to get you to let you see too much. So this was a photograph taken just after the uh, one of these sessions uh, was over. You see this building in the background, and I have a few more images of this setting as well. Um, this is like the, the community to sell. And here is again the building from another perspective. Um, you must imagine a bench uh, put up in front of this building, this is the municipal building, and you had the 19 judges uh, sitting there on benches listening to the community. The community was seated on the grass, again, the chacha, justice on the grass. Um, and um, assembly members may speak up and may, for example, provide evidence or may provide any information the court is seeking. But, so this is a, a typical setting of one of these jurisdictions in Rwanda. That is what they looked like. This is where lay justice was, was dispensed. Um, now, and this is like the view from like, where the judges were sitting, basically. And of course, if you're a um, participant observer, you were treated as, as an authority figure as well. So you would be seated next to the judges, which makes it sometimes difficult to really do the kind of research you're interested in, because people would be reluctant. They'll identify you with the government. And it's very, very difficult to spend a great deal of time in the field, so you can overcome some of the, the, the misperceptions people may have of you, that you really are not the government, you're really an independent um, entity. Of course, Sadambal has spent much time in Rwanda as well. Um, I, I, uh, I encourage you to talk with him about his experience um, that even preceded mine, so he was at a very, very critical juncture uh, and has written widely on, um, on these issues. Now, in the wake of the institutional choice um, of the Gachacha jurisdiction, Many international observers professed somewhat naively, I would submit, elation that a model of restorative justice um, was being pursued in post-genocide Rwanda, one that would counterbalance the presumed failure of international justice in Arusha, Tanzania. And here you have an image of the, uh, the main entrance of the ICTR um, in Arusha, Tanzania, where I also conducted um, some research years ago. Um, here is a representative account of the hopes that these observers had for the operation of the Gachacha jurisdictions. As a mode of communal justice, Gachacha operates on three crucial levels, one observer says. As a traditional mode of dispute resolution, its operation entails a high degree of social authority and legitimacy. Its dialogic function generates an open discursive space through which the community itself can create a collective memory of the genocide. On a psychological and emotional level, the process allows the victims, the aggressors, and the community to reach a level of mutual understanding and recognition which may facilitate the process of social reintegration and coexistence. And I think many did attach these hopes, and, and I had certain hopes for this model as well, um, and yet it turned out to become something very, very different. I'll talk about this more today. So while it's too early to assess conclusively the performance of Rwanda's Gachacha jurisdictions. Again, 1.1 million judgments, they're, they're only due to a close. There's not good documentation of these proceedings for a number of different reasons, deliberate and otherwise. Um, but I, I demonstrate in my book that neither a high degree of social authority nor of legitimacy was associated with these jurisdictions. 
many perpetrators and survivors from the outset were apprehensive about this institutional choice, and for the most part, remained so during its three years. What is more, the discursive space that in theory became associated with community courts never opened up in many of them in practice. Lastly, in as much as social integration and coexistence um, could indeed be observed in the countryside, it is doubtful whether a level of mutual understanding and recognition was responsible for bringing about these outcomes. I believe that the jurisdictions were actually even worse than some, uh, met, some critics later alleged. I'm suggesting that they were, were more than merely a failed experiment in traditional justice. And again, I'm, I'm um, a number of a couple of different voices in this, uh, in this dialogue. One book um, by Phil Clark, Oxford is forthcoming later this year. He, for example, uh, does not share my skepticism. His is a more... Um, positive assessment overall, to the extent that I can tell, um, of the jurisdictions and the one I offer. Um, other important contributors to this debate were Lars Waldorf, he's at the University of York in England, um, and peripherally also, of course, the late Alison de Forge, who lied last, last year in a, in a plane crash, and others. So there is a debate among scholars of the institution as to what they really mean. I just want you to know that, so to, to, for you to take what I'm saying as a grain of salt. Mine is it's definitely a critical account, but it's not the only account. You can come um, arguably to, to different conclusions. But I believe there, so for example, Lars Waldorf, my colleague uh, and friend, is suggesting that this is a, a failed um, experiment in traditional justice. That's not really my focus. Uh, I'm suggesting above and beyond a, a failure in traditional justice, these institutions evolved. They weren't like this from the beginning, but they evolved into what I call an irregular system. Actually, this is Jeremy Bentham, not me, but an irregular system of warfare. And I call that lawfare. And I'll elaborate this in a, in a minute. And this is where I depart from, say, Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International um, or other critics who focus on like, due process issues with regard to jurisdictions, that there's no defense uh, attorneys being provided, for example, in these courts. That there's many evidentiary uh, problems having to do with uh, rules, of uh, rules of procedure of evidence, for example. But these issues don't concern me quite as much. I'm suggesting the shortcomings are, are far more significant than that. Um, so this is where Human Rights Watch and I uh, depart in terms of our criticism. Now, the difference lies in our optics. While they, Human Rights Watch Amnesty, who have published very critical reports, um, take a snapshot view of the jurisdictions, I place them in comparative historical perspective. What is more, I partially extract from the jurisdiction's ostensible pur purpose, the delivery of transitional justice. Now, in addition to process tracing their development over time, um, I draw within case comparisons with other what I call projects of state in Rwandan history. And I think then we gain a completely different understanding of this institution of the Chacha jurisdictions. And on this view, a far more sinister institution emerges than even the harshest critics of due process thought possible. What I chronicle in a nutshell is a transition from lawmaking to lawfare. Um, but to be sure, and again, my argument uh, it does not suggest that this transition was uh, preordained. Um, it was an outcome of structured contingency. There was no deterministic evolution that this actually had to happen. Um, I believe it was the result of subtle intertwinings of, of instrumental choice and expressive choice. And I can elaborate later if you like. I won't bore you with um, social scientific details of all of this. Um, so let me remind you where I am in my presentation. Um, I've just basically gone through the first part provided a brief overview of the case of Rwanda and given you a preview of my argument um, and the various other positions out there. So let's now turn to defining lawfare. What do I really mean by this term, uh, which some of you may have heard in a different context? So by focusing on the invention of the Gachacha jurisdictions in particular, I'm analyzing the making of lawfare, what Jeremy Bentham, British um, legal philosopher and philosopher more generally, called an irregular system of warfare. And it's worth repeating verbatim what the Englishman had to say. And I believe he was the first to recognize the institution that, that I call lawfare today. He was one to refer to a certain form of lawmaking as an irregular system of warfare. And here's Bentham. Legislation is a state of warfare. 
Political mischief is the enemy. The legislator is the commander. The moral and religious sanctions his allies. Punishment and rewards the forces he has under his command. Punishments is regular standing force. Rewards an occasional subsidiary force too weak to act alone. The mechanical branch of legislation, the art of tactics. Direct legislation, a formal attack made with the main body of his forces in the open field. Indirect legislation, a secret plan of connected and long concerted operations to be executed in the way of stratagem of petite guerre. Bentham observed that this irregular system of warfare stands in much higher favor with men in general than that which is carried on by open force. He found the reason for this appeal in the economy with which it may be used and the ingenuity which it is thought to require. Given this, for some rulers, engaging in lawfare is far less conspicuous a strategy than waging warfare. And I believe this actually captures the rise of lawfare in Rwanda pretty well. Um, <coughs> aside from the fact that uh, lawfare requires neither a modern weapon system nor a standing or rebel army, the international donor community has come to willingly underwrite, <laughs> often unwillingly, lawfare's costs because the institutions of what I call lawfare are often and typically hidden in projects dedicated to furthering democracy and the rule of law. I therefore introduce lawfare as a conceptually and analytically distinct form of legal contention, um, a political strategy not previously theorized in any systematic fashion. And inasmuch as warfare has been a long-standing subject in the social sciences from, from Hobbes to Charles <coughs> Tilly, who passed away recently, at Columbia, lawfare has been virtually absent in the literature on state formation. Um, I'm not quite sure if you are familiar with this aphorism, but let me just throw it at you anyway. Like restating an influential one, uh, my aim is to show how under certain circumstances law made the state and the state made law. So I substitute law for the idea of war, and I think this captures very much um, the changing nature of warfare in the international system, where outright war um, is far more costly than it usually than it, than it previously has been. So this is going to be a little bit theoretical now, so I hope you, you don't mind my indulging um, in, in my discipline for a little bit. So I conceive of lawfare as a revolutionary strategy for broadcasting power. And by revolutionary, I mean a strategy aimed at the systematic overhaul in whole or in part of the principal foundations of politics and society in a given mm. polity, domestic or otherwise. As in warfare, the principal function of lawfare is the defeat of an enemy, real or imagined. The aim of lawfare is the imposition of the victor's will on the enemy. Unlike warfare, however, lawfare typically does not involve the institutionalization of violence. Although the use of force is ever present in both strategies of conflict, in the context of lawfare, defeat and imposition are brought about not by rifles, but by rule. And it's this critical <coughs> functional difference that distinguishes lawmaking or the routine uses of law from lawfare, what I consider the exceptional uses of law. So whereas both lawmaking and lawfare, and I'm mentioning this because this is often a challenge I get, well, isn't lawfare just common everywhere? Isn't that what we do? How is this different from lawmaking? What is the distinction? This is very, very difficult to wrap your head around, and I'm not sure I've really succeeded yet, so I would invite any comments that you might have. But um, I'm trying to push the warfare, lawfare analogy as far as I can and to try to distinguish different types of, of using the law um, to achieve certain objectives. Now, so whereas both lawmaking and lawfare serve the standard functions of control and regulation in a given polity, only lawfare qua system is intended to serve a function otherwise considered a hallmark of warfare, the defeat of an enemy. Ordinary lawmaking is not about defeating an enemy. It's usually about regulation, it's control, and you might say it's partisan and whatever else, but it really has a different function um, than defeating an enemy. Right? And that's the difference between, for example, ordinary use of violence by police forces from using violence in war. Right? So try to maybe see if the analogy makes sense. Routine uses of violence, police forces, exceptional uses, war. Routine uses of law, lawmaking, exceptional uses, lawfare. That's the way I have come to think about this. Um, so lawfare, as I see it, is about the rule of law as a political weapon. Um, and what distinguishes the use of lawfare from other uses of law for repressive ends, because you might tell me, well, look about Argentina or Pinochet, or look at the Soviet Union, 
there you had sort of under the guise of law, um, coercion of violence was committed as well. So how is this, is this lawfare or not? And I would say it depends. Um, because what, what I consider the hallmark of, of lawfare is that it's not deployed arbitrarily or selectively, but really as a system, on a systematic basis over a longer period of time. And I'm going to give you more examples in a minute, which hopefully will illuminate these theoretical elaborations. Um, so lawfare is, in other words, a long-term strategy of lawmaking, rather than a tactic thereof. Right? If you think about the military context, strategy and tactics, what the differences are, that's what I apply to the idea of lawfare as well. Um, and echoing Bentham, you can wage lawfare by a number of different means, by constitutional enactments, by ordinary legislation, by Supreme Court uh, decisions, presidential decrees, and even other regulatory instruments. That's the argument I'm, I'm putting forth. Um, so the, the, the point of lawfare is the crafting an, crafting an integrated, really an integrated system of rules um, that is aimed at the reconstruction of social order. So let's skip a little bit um, ahead. Let me just, um, so you see the different strategies. I'm considering warfare and lawfare to be both two different strategies to, again, defeat an enemy. And you can wage both warfare and lawfare internally as well as externally. Right? So I'm really pushing the analogy with warfare. Um, and here we have a typology. Um, so if you basically combine, if you also allow that um, democratic regimes may wage both war, warfare and warfare, um, also authoritarian regimes um, can wage it. Right? Then you have the internal and external, you have four different subtypes, if you will. This sort of scientists deal with concepts, subtypes, right? So and here I'm going to discuss a few more examples above and beyond one. Um, and maybe in an aside, um, because some of you may be familiar with this. Um, it's worth mentioning that the idea of lawfare gained some ground in the wake of 9-11. Um, the origin of the term is often credited to, to Major General Charles Dunlap, uh, Jr., who first used it in a 2001 working paper at Harvard's um, Carr Center for Human Rights. Um, so mostly conservative pundits actually have embraced the term of lawfare to disparage the reach of international law into U.S. politics. And like the most recent example of this was um, in the wake of the so-called Goldstone Report um, on Israel's um, actions in, the, in uh, with regard to the Palestinian conflict, um, critics of Goldstone have said this is lawfare, right? This is, again, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, all these crusaders using the law to disparage Israel. And the same arguments have been made by, by Cheney and others uh, regarding human rights critiques of, for example, um, uh, uh, you know, acts that were committed in Abu Ghraib and elsewhere. Right? So this is a different use of the term lawfare. Um, I'm really departing from this really, um, how should I put it, this, this very um, um, how should I put it, uh, the, the very, it's sort of a uh, tactical deployment of the term to disparage somebody else. I'm trying to rescue it and make it into, into a proper um, scientific concept, um, if you will. Um, I actually have, have here a quote on the Israeli issue. Um, some observer wrote that, quote, lawfare is the exploitation of courts in democratic countries in order to harass Israeli officials with civil lawsuits and criminal investigations for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and other alleged violations of international law. Right? That's not what I talk about. Um, mine is really an attempt to, to take this idea seriously and not necessarily to use it um, to, to disparage an, an enemy. Right? It's really a neutral concept as far as I'm concerned. So we have four ideal types, basically internal democratic law for internal authoritarian, external democratic, external authoritarian. And this is what I meant when I said earlier, I believe that what I'm saying about Rwanda may have application and validity above and beyond the same case. Right? So you might say that like Jim Crow legislation in the US, with which you're familiar, obviously, uh, you might liken this or consider this to be a strategy of warfare because you had hundreds of uh, statutes and other legal instruments that formed together a system of repression in the South, right? But this was actually conducted within a democratic setting, if you consider the US as the, as the unit of analysis, not the South. So I think this is an example of lawfare as well. It was a revolutionary strategy for broadcasting power aimed at the reconstruction of the, of the foundations of politics in society in the South. Right? Um, you might say that uh, colonialism uh, or different 
uh, inst instance of colonialism may resemble um, something I call lawfare. And actually, the anthropologist John Komarov in Chicago was the first to use the term in this connection. He didn't elaborate the concept, which makes it very, very difficult to substantiate the argument. So my theoretical uh, elaborations are important because then we can go out into the field and actually look for the thing and see if it exists or doesn't exist. Right? But he believed, for example, the way in which uh, whether the British, the French, the Germans, and others colon and other colonial governments used the law in order to suppress, in order to, to, uh, to, to uh, conquer other societies, was akin to lawfare. Right? And the one country I worked on, South Africa, um, you might say was an instance of this. You may think of this idea of indirect rule as well, where many colonial um, uh, administrations relied upon local chiefs to set up a, what's become known as customary law. And customary law was an invention uh, 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 during colonialism. So this might be another instance of lawfare that is waged by essentially authoritarian regimes, if you like, uh, but externally. Right? You also actually might think and apply this term to something that we uh, are familiar with in the international justice context. Right? And I believe this is really, really interesting. And I think this is, again, not to, to, to disparage something, but simply to capture it. Consider the ICC, or the ICDY, ICDR, terms I think you're familiar with, like the Yugoslavia Tribunal, the Rwanda Tribunal, and Arusha. If you look at the Security Council resolution that established the ICTR and the ICDY, you find this language uh, that their aim was to contribute to the maintenance of international peace and security. Of course, the phrase had to be in there because under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, this was the only way you could establish these tribunals. But if you think about this for a moment, if you also think about um, the international community's inability and or, and or unwillingness to respond militarily to conflicts in the former Yugoslavia or in Rwanda, you might say, well, this was basically the functional equivalent. We responded by waging lawfare. We responded by, for example, instituting these courts. And you might say these are revolutionary strategies to a certain extent because they are aimed at reconstructing the foundations um, of international law as it existed before. Right? So it's to bring basically account to end impunity, as, uh, as it were, and to really introduce international criminal law as a, as a powerful force. And this really has essentially happened. This is going on. And something, just to, to, to quickly uh, round up the discussion, um, you probably are familiar with um, the various Darfur proceedings at the ICC, right? And I'm not quite sure what you think about this, I'm, I'm interested to discuss it with you. But the uh, arrest warrant was issued for President Bashir of Sudan, of course, right? Um, there's been a great deal of discussion about this. I personally am very, very critical of this peculiar strategy by the Office of the Prosecutor of the ICC. And I think that the various ways in which various legal concepts have been involved may be akin to a strategy of warfare as well. You're trying to, to defeat, for example, your enemy in Sudan by way of law. Right? And I think this has been a, a very aggressive attempt um, that is above and beyond maybe some of the ordinary uses of international law by these tribunals. So I would submit that uh, the actions of, of a person I, I personally work with, Luis Moreno Campo, um, is sort of overreaching in certain regards. I'm not, I'm not suggesting the ICC per se, but in certain instances, this may be actually a, a great deal of grandstanding and sort of pushing above and beyond what the evidence actually can contribute. And I mentioned this over dinner yesterday. Um, you, you may know this, but you had a couple of high-profile lawyers um, leave the office of the prosecutor and protest over the case that was uh, being built to, to indict Bashir on the argument that there was no empirical evidence that this president was actually <coughs> criminally responsible for genocide and some of the other acts. Right? And these are the instances where it's like, okay, maybe this is an instance of lawfare. We're trying to do something above and beyond simply bringing a case or adjudicating a given case. Okay, so let me turn, remind you where I am. So I, I equated you with my idea of lawfare, and um, if you're a little bit confused, it's entirely normal. This is like a, probably a great deal of, of, of abstraction, maybe more than you're used to, um, and also it's, it's, it's not entirely easy to wrap your head around. And it took me a couple of years to actually formulate this as well. Um, but now I'm going to talk about post-genocide one. Right? This is probably why many of, of you are here in the first place. And I'm going to, to suggest um, how this term actually may help us. And then I also will, will close, not, not too far uh, soon, in order to allow us um, to have a discussion about these themes as well. And what you see here is a table, and you don't need to really concern yourself with the detail, but this is a table um, 
of prosecutions that were undertaken post-genocide Rwanda uh, in the ordinary court system. And this is a court system that Professor Drumble uh, is intimately familiar with because he actually served as a defender. Uh, of many of those who appeared in these Sham specific No, defender, not defendant. Defender. I thought I said that, but that's no, just em there's, there's no. <laughs> you, should better, you better emphasize this. Right? <laughs> um, so he was intimately involved. He knows far more about this than, than I, I possibly, possibly do. Um, so one of the arguments um, that was made, and the government always made, and I think this, this, is, uh, this, is not, uh, this is not wrong, I think this really was an important factor, is that we had to turn to an, um, an experiment such as the Gachacha jurisdictions because the ordinary court system simply was, was just not capable of dealing with trying genocide suspects. By one <coughs> account, you had, um, after the genocide in Rwanda, eight lawyers left eight lawyers in the entire country. These are not all like criminal attorneys. These are just eight lawyers left. Um, the Minister of Justice didn't have an office at first, right? And he kept the files under his bed. Um, but this was a really, you know, it was a depleted system. It really didn't exist. So we, we have to take this into account and do take this seriously. So whatever I say critically later on, um, I do believe that there were many voices in Rwanda who I think really were, were um, genuinely committed to not only responding to the solution, but also to realizing, um, I think, <coughs> just an equitable system of sort of um, uh, participatory justice. I think it became something else, but I think there was a genuine attempt to do so. So what you had basically, after six years in the ordinary courts, you had about 10,000 defendants tried. Right? And the estimate of the number of perpetrators varies. We don't really have a good figure. The Rwandan government, for a number of instrumental reasons, suggests the number of perpetrators might be as high as one million. Um, other scholars have suggested it's probably closer to about 250,000. But of course, it's very, very <coughs> difficult to verify. Um, at the time that I was in Rwanda, um, the prisons held about 120,000 detainees. And this number like, um, went down afterwards. But you can imagine like, the number of, of people that, that were supposed to be tried. Uh, one estimate, I'm not sure if you know where it comes from, that we also can't verify, but one estimate, um, it would have taken the ordinary system, what, 300 years or so to prosecute all cases. Um, I'm not sure if that's true, but of course, an, an inordinate amount of time. And you get some idea on the, on, on sort of the, um, so I believe there's different stages in, in the way in which the Gachacha jurisdictions um, really developed. There was initially deliberations in 1995, a couple of international experts and others came together at an important conference. Um, one of them was William Shabas, whom you may have read in one of the classes. Um, and that's when the Chacha was first mentioned. It was just sort of a, it came out in one of the working groups. It wasn't really an important uh, solution. But that's sort of when the idea first emerged. And then there were a couple of consultation meetings by the former president. Um, and um, there was a, um, sort of UN involvement as well. There was some consultation. People thought about different ways of doing it. And what I call modernization basically um, led to uh, turning this informal system, which supposedly existed. I'm saying supposedly because we have no historical data or indication at all that this really was a traditional system. There's one article that's, that's, that's frequently cited in Kenya Rwanda, which is based on incomplete sources. Um, we really have no idea. <coughs> it's an assumption that this was a traditional institution, but we have no anthropological or other evidence to suggest that it actually did. We have one article by a Belgian scholar who suggested um, that the institution, he studied this institution in one community uh, in the early 80s, and incidentally, he, it seems as if he coined the term gachacha. So what's called gachacha and supposedly <coughs> traditional, Rwanda is actually never based on our knowledge today, never really called the chacha. So it's like a retrospective um, sort of traditionalization, if you will, like an invented tradition um, as, far as, it, as far as we can tell so far. And then you have a legalization stage where uh, the modernization stage also included some other alternatives, for example, to have um, courts at, at sort of lower levels, but ordinary courts in a different kind of system in which we can use cases. This was... Um, rejected for a number of different reasons and because of a number of different power plays within the regime where in the end young lawyers sort of um, won the order of the day, which is why the Gachacha jurisdiction became this, 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 this really legal institution I mentioned before. Um, and then there was sensitization, but I can... Oh, what's the heck? <laughs> this is not good. Oh, you're up. There we go. Um, so there was 
Um, and these are some of the, I call them normal entrepreneurs. These are some of the individuals, and you don't need to remember, remember them, I'll just put them up for completion's sake, who were involved in these discussions and they had an important role to play at the time. And I interviewed all of them um, to get a sense of what these internal deliberations were all about. This was rather difficult to do, right? this is in 2002, because at the time, nobody quite knew what would become of this institution, right? And many of those involved were extremely afraid to be associated with it. Because if it, God forbid, were to fail, um, this would be the end of their career and often their lives as well. So people were extremely reluctant to actually acknowledge um, any involvement in these kinds of deliberations. So it's extremely difficult. And if you go back today, you will get responses from individuals that rewrite history just a little bit. Um, so they may actually claim involvement or deny involvement for a number of different instrumental reasons. Um, and this goes back, or, or maybe not back, but this speaks to the difficulties of researching these kinds of um, uh, institutions in post-conflict um, societies. And I know a couple of you have done something similar. Um, since you're lawyers, and many of you are lawyers, um, this is the legislative progression of the jurisdictions. Um, you see like the levels were reduced, the number of judges was reduced, uh, the quorum was reduced, but here 19 and it's actually 7, I said earlier 9, uh, the latest number is actually 7 judges, because people couldn't really get together these, these court uh, quorums. Okay, so now let me turn to um, more of the argument. I believe that these institutions turned into an, ins into an institution of lawfare for a number of different reasons. First of all, you have to appreciate the convictions uh, of the post-genocidal regime. You have to, Mount Mamdani, a scholar at Columbia, whose work has been very controversial, but I believe he is right to say that the Tutsi elite who invaded Rwanda, who overthrew the genocidal regime, um, sort of acted on three different convictions. Uh, there was a moral responsibility for the very survival of all remaining Tutsi. This was really, really felt. Rwanda is the size of Connecticut, it's a small country. Um, as you probably know, many of the Genesis um, had fled to the, the what's today the Democratic Republic of Congo, the DRC, uh, were actually hosted there, if you will, um, by the international aid community in refugee camps where many of the Genesis were rearming themselves, right, and were actually waging and launching attacks into Rwanda. So this was a really important conviction and also a plausible one, that you really have to guard yourself um, against sort of a repeat of the genocide. Uh, another important conviction was that Tutsi power was the minimum condition for Tutsi survival, that you really had to create a Tutsi let's state. Otherwise, being the minority in this country, you simply would not be able um, to have a share in power. And lastly, that an armed peace was the only peace possible between Hutu and Tutsi. And this has to do a little bit with the, um, with the evolution of the RPF um, as a, from the beginning as a guerrilla force that invaded Rwanda to, to a govern and governing party. And this idea that militarization is the most important development and or the most important challenge it was confirmed a couple of times. I interviewed the president, Kagame, as well in 2003 for the first time, and he's, he made no bones about the fact that militarizing Rwanda was the most important task for him at the time. And these things are important to appreciate uh, when we begin to assess the workings of, of justice and, and so on as well. I am, again, I, I do not believe that, that lawfare, as I define it, was really on the mind of those in Rwanda from the very beginning. There was far too many different things going on. Um, but I believe approximately uh, sort of 2000, maybe a little bit later, um, lawfare became a strategy that the government pursued. And I think this had to do with a number of different intervening um, the developments. Um, namely, internally, the application of violence against regime uh, dissenters was not really tolerated any longer by the international community. Up until that point in time, the um, RPF-led regime, the Tutsi-led regime, um, had assassinated and otherwise detained, harassed anyone and everyone, uh, anyone who would um, voice criticism of the new regime. Right? So this was a really blatant attempt at silencing opposition. Um, the international community initially went along with this uh, for a long time on account of this, um, the, the shame that it felt for having, if you will, neglected Rwanda during the genocide. Um, I call this a genocide tax that the RPF basically levied um, on the international community. Um, but there, the first sort of like pushback started happening internationally. Criticism was being voiced, criticism of some of the, uh, of, for example, the death penalty, right? The, the first, um, uh, I think it was 20, 20 uh, convicted defendants in the ordinary courts 
uh, were publicly um, executed, and this caused a huge uproar. And I think then things started to shift a little bit, that sort of basically waging warfare or violence internally became essentially very, very costly. Also at that point in time, you had the first uh, criticism that was being um, uh, addressed to Rwanda uh, on account of its involvement, deep involvement in the Democratic Republic of Congo in terms of waging war there, looting the country as well. There was an important UN panel um, that documented very excessively Rwandan involvement in, in, in looting uh, the DRC and basically waging war there. And so all of a sudden, warfare as conventionally waged, um, I'm suggesting, was or became too costly for the regime. Right? So from the beginning, you had ordinary lawmaking, you had constitutional processes, you had um, all kinds of different manners of law were being taken seriously. But then in addition, you also had the law being used as a political weapon, I suggest, um, increasingly. Um, if you talk about the effect of the jurisdiction, this is like the first prime minister who already, when you, when you read this, this quote, um, is, is very wary of the manner in which um, the RPF cracked down on internal um, dissenters. Many, initially, you, you, you may know this, the government of national unity included many hundred <coughs> things. Right? And this was interpreted by many as a sign of, of a willingness to, to coexist and <coughs> not to reconcile. Many of these internal appointees were either forced out, they were assassinated, they were detained. Um, the first president, Pastor Bizemungu, who was Hutu as well, um, he was actually detained and then put on trial. So under his auspices, the idea of the Kachacha jurisdictions was actually considered. But many of those internal critics were first sort of either sidelined or entirely removed. And I think that's when a different climate began to emerge in Rwanda. And I think much of the optimism um, disappeared as well. Um, so what I'm suggesting um, is basically that the jurisdictions have produced fear and insecurity in the daily lives of survivors and perpetrators. And I must give you a summary of what I'd be happy to elaborate on this. Um, in particular, they have led to self-sanctioning behavior, uh, not true, I'm suggesting. And they reproduce state power on the local level. Um, so the way I see Gachacha today, you have to imagine, remember 12,000 jurisdictions? So the entire country is basically covered by the system. Uh, and you have lawyers basically traveling from jurisdiction to jurisdiction as well, monitoring the goings on there. And what you have to know here as well is that state power historically has been extremely strong, strong in Rwanda. So that's the idea of the state held, carries a lot of weight, a lot of force. So you don't even need to um, coerce people directly. The sort of the presentation of state power is enough for them to self-sanction, to change their behavior. Um, this was a little bit like, like, like Germany, especially in the interwar period and in Nazi Germany as well. You don't really need violence per se. But people have this, this certain obedience. I wouldn't want to say it's cultural, but I think it's more social. It's something that was created um, primarily in the late 19th century in the King of Ogiri, when the country was reunited. Then the importance of the state and this crackdown and the use of violence was very, very prevalent. The memory of this violence, the memory of state power, is still very, very prevalent today, which is also why, again, researchers like me are considered to be representatives of the state or represent authority. So this is to say these jurisdictions have created basically self-sanctioning behavior. People will, will censor themselves. They will not speak openly in these jurisdictions. While the idea is very, very appealing, and again, I initially had a, a great deal of hope as well, the manner in which they have been administered and the manner in which they function um, is anything but this open discursive space. People will participate because they have to. Because whenever they didn't participate, someone would knock on their door and tell them, why are you not a Gachacha jurisdiction? And there are many examples like that that really are very, very different um, from what we would understand, I think, as, as participatory justice. And if all of this is going on, you have to raise questions about um, the value of the mechanism for transitional justice, right? And, and, uh, and these terms that are thrown around, reconciliation today, right? One of my Rwandan friends, and we discuss this all the time, what you see is coexistence. Yes, people are not killing one another, but I'm not quite sure you can necessarily take it as evidence of reconciliation. Because again, it's the, one of the poorest countries in the world. People often have no choice but to coexist. They're poor. Um, the DRC is not really a spot you want to go to, you want to flee to. Uh, in Burundi, in Uganda, Tanzania, you may be discriminated against because there's a great deal of xenophobia towards foreigners in that region as well. So you're kind of stuck in this country. And again, it's one of the most densely populated in the world as well. So you actually can't really hide anywhere else. 
um, also because the state has like this really this this long reach um, into every corner of the country, and, and I call this like ocular authoritarian control. I'm not quite sure if you're familiar with Michel Foucault and thinkers like that. Um, what about the panopticon you may have heard? This like prison system. And I believe something similar is basically going on in Rwanda as well. Like you don't need really uh, the force of the state, just the presence of the state is enough. I'll give you another example of how this works or why this culturally works. Um, I, for example, I did many interviews in prisons with, with perpetrators as well. And there's one prison in Kibuye, which is sort of on Lake Kibu, uh, not far from the DRC. And it was amazing. The prison doesn't exist anymore, but in, in 2002 I was there, and this was a prison holding about, I don't know, a few thousand detainees. <coughs> and it was open in the back, and the front entrance was guarded, if you will, or, or secured with a piece of rope. That's one piece of rope. And they were all milling around in there, thousands of detainees, and you have maybe three or four or five guards, like, you know, lazily sitting in the sun with their rifle. And, and nobody actually <coughs> tried to escape. And of course, early on, I think people tried to escape and they were massacred very, very quickly. So this may have, you know, sort of created disincentives for trying to do it. And yet, you can say that now, right? This is still very remarkable. And I think this is just one small illustration of, of the way in which state power works in this society. And I think it's really important that, that you really never understand society um, like properly. And it's not necessarily comparable to, to many other places. But this is also how the jurisdictions have worked. That is why um, I think it that we ought to look at them um, uh, very critically. And what also has happened is that in, in recent years, the jurisdictions now are closed in a, in a few minutes, don't worry. Um, they have been used to, to for example, ostracize who to men, and they've been, uh, been used to, to get rid of dissenters as well. Um, there's been a great deal of corruption involved in these kinds of spaces. You have, for example, um, you have also victims who testify have been, have been killed afterwards for the testimony they gave. And so this is not necessarily part of lawfare, but they have been very, very controversial in Rwanda. And I think because of all of these, these side effects, some of which unintended, um, we ought to be very, uh, very skeptical um, before we, um, I think, um, sort of try to export them as the next sort of model of transitional justice. And I'm also saying this because the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in <coughs> Africa, of course, has been exported around the world, so to speak, about the idea, right? And, and there's an interesting book by Richard Wilson, a British anthropologist, um, and he, for example, is a very, very critical book of the TRC, and he is suggesting even this institution, which few people have something negative to say about, wasn't as successful as it's made out to be in South Africa, right? And then that sort of should give one pause uh, when considering the effect of these gacha um, <coughs> um this is uh, drawn from a dissertation that, that's marvelous by a scientist um, at Dalhousie University in Canada. Uh, and she, for example, I mentioned this yesterday with a drum ball, and she arrived in Rwanda a week before the genocide, then had to leave the country and later came back. And she has been working as one community for a number of different years. And the advantage is through the immersion, she actually gained the trust of Rwandans, right? they could be reasonably sure that she would not rat them out. She would not share the information that individuals share with her with the government. Um, and this is, for example, taken from one interview. She did, like I think, 37 long, in-depth uh, interviews and, and such with, with these um, victims and others. And, and here she describes, if you can read this, um, sort of the fears that, that many ordinary runners had about participating <laughs> in the jurisdiction. And again, this speaks to, to some of, of to the repressive nature of some of them. Again, I'm not suggesting all jurisdictions would have been as repressive or would have been bad, so to speak. Right? Again, there has been death in 12,000, 1 million judgments. We may very well find in the years to come um, that some of the jurisdictions and some countries worked very, very well and did achieve some of these outcomes. So far, based on, on my observation, the research, based on the observation by others uh, that I've seen so far, um, it doesn't seem as if there's too much evidence um, of such positive outcomes. Um, I'm just going to skip through a couple of things that I think would bring us too far away. This is a quote from the Kagami interview um, that I mentioned earlier. Um, so he suggested that the military has a political function as well. Right? So if you, and that's what I'm suggesting. If you, if you think historically the role of the military, the role of also the military logic within the RPF, um, you, I think, see the argument becomes more plausible that this is something akin to warfare. Right? That there is sort of ethos within the RPF that you have to defeat an enemy. 
And there are many, many other examples in contemporary Rwanda from land reform, somebody might be interested in. There was forced villagization. There was so akin to forced removals under apartheid. People were not asked to, to move to villages. They were simply transplanted from one place to another without compensation. Right? And there were a number of different things. There were like, uh, solidarity camps. You have to basically undergo um, re-education. Right? So you can really be trusted by your military officer or police officer or anybody else. You get re-educated. So there are a number of different institutions that all together suggest that this is really authoritarian. And if you look basically, and I have a, I think a, if you, this, is, this, is some, this is historically, um, this is what uh, is actually interesting here. If you take an historical long-term view, you will see that these kinds of projects of state are nothing new in Rwanda. Right? This begins with Ubu Hake, personal clientship, um, back in time, Uberetwa, Muganda. Muganda is forced labor, community service, which Rwandans cannot escape. It still exists today. Um, then you have uh, Imidubudu, is the villagization policy I talked about, which you also had in Tanzania in the 60s. Um, in Gando are these re-education camps, and then you have the Gachacha jurisdiction. So if you look at Gachacha separately, only through the lens of transitional justice, you might find some value in it. Right? However, if you compare it to other goings on in Rwanda today, and historically, this might just be another project of state that is aimed at broadcasting power, aimed at controlling the countryside. And, and I suggest personally, these are the context-specific evaluations we ought to engage in when we speak about transitional justice, whether it's in Sierra Leone or in Cambodia or elsewhere. I think we ought to be extremely knowledgeable about the context in which we operate. And the danger with many of us, and I'm guilty of this too, is we descend in these com into these communities and countries without actually knowing much about them, right? Um, this happened to me in Rwanda. I, mean, I didn't know much about this. There were many scholars who knew this for decades. I wasn't one of them. But often in the traditional justice community, we tend to gloss over some of the subtleties and complexities in that given society because we're just overwhelmed by the task of, for example, working in, in a court or working for an NGO or whatever else. And also, you may know this, the NGO community or the national community, it's very, very tight in these settings. So there actually usually is not much context <coughs> outside of your sort of international cohort, if you, will, uh, if you will. So often, you actually may pass on a very incomplete information to others. And this happened in Rwanda in terms of culpability. The international um, represent community represented there, you had uh, many uh, young representatives who were like, posted in Rwanda, didn't know anything, and they were taken out two years later. So any accumulated knowledge you might have had about society wasn't necessarily passed on. And I think this is, to talk very briefly, I think this is where, to a certain extent, the aiding and abetting the of these kinds of repressive efforts come in. Not necessarily willingly or, or advertently, but inadvertently, through like sort of an, an incomplete preparation for these tasks. And this goes back to the rule of law as technology, rather than sociology and politics. Right? So I think if, you had, um, if we have a better understanding of societies, we might be in a better position to anticipate um, consequences that might be set some of the efforts at transitional justice. Thank you all. Great. Questions, comments. Uh, I'll let. I, I always have stuff to say, but I'll <laughs> let anyone else start off first. So, well, I guess if no one wants to start off, I will. Yeah, Anna. Um, so, if you're so critical of the Gachacha jurisdictions, what do you think can be changed, or what do you think, you know, would be a solution? It's a good question, uh, and a difficult one. Um, I think it's probably too late um, for changing anything. Uh, and this is something that I developed in an earlier book as well. It's the idea of path dependence and economics, right? And the idea of sunk costs. Once you're down a path for too long, you've invested too many resources and you have shaped expectations, it's very, very difficult to turn back. And so I think, I suspect it's probably too late for un to, to undo some of these um, these, I believe, negative consequences. Um, what could have been done differently, but they counterfactual. I think the idea uh, was 
a good one in principle. You know, I, I like the idea of, say, community justice and again involving the population in addressing this. Um, I think that the regime got carried away uh, and we still have to find out why exactly this happened. But I think it became too much of a legal institution again. Um, so it might very well have worked, but the political climate was not necessarily conducive um, to sort of a, an open and fair use of this, this really interesting, theoretically interesting and plausible mechanism. Right now, what can be done? I mean, something that could be done, and it's really, really interesting. Rwanda is holding uh, elections again next year in the summer. It'll be very interesting what happens then. If it's, it'll be violent or not, it remains to be seen. Um, I think, also, one thing I should mention too, what the regime did too, it banned any and all independent uh, organizations in the country. And there, were, there was legislation, um, for example, um, against genocide ideology. So any critic is, is deemed as, a, as, a, uh, as engaging in divisionism and basically spreading genocide. There was a law passed to that effect. This is another instance of warfare. Right? So you have jurisdictions, you have legislation, all these things together. Um, what could be done is you could, for example, um, you know, open political society to a certain extent and allow dissent publicly being voiced as well. Um, you know, potentially you might be able to, to bring in the pawns of the regime into a governing coalition. And um, all of this may be uh, both symbolically important to suggest that this is not just a two-seat dictatorship. Uh, and I think it would also, uh, and sort of, it would signal a sort of a, a different <coughs> mindset. And I think it might actually allay some of the fears and concerns that those who are currently oppressed <coughs> have. But I think many of the ill will that the jurisdictions created um, will, will persist for, for some time to come. Which is why some observers also believe that you know violence, if not imminent, is, is sort of on the horizon again. Very, very differently. Not a genocide. <coughs> some believe that it might come in the form of a military coup from within, um, because the regime has also, for example, got rid of many former loyalists. Right? And so the idea is now that that this will not be a Hutu Tutsi divide. Um, this might be a, a Hutu Tutsi coalition against the current regime. Um, some believe also that the reason why President Kagame doesn't travel internationally quite as often anymore, aside from the, the French prosecution issue, um, is that he's afraid of leaving the country behind, uh, sort of un, you know, with, without having really a hold on, on, on goings on there. Um, so I, I fear the country has traveled maybe too far down a, a very negative direction in, for it to really be a success story of, of transitional justice or yeah, please. Um, I'm really fascinated with the concept of lawfare in general, um, but would you say that there's only negative consequences from using lawfare? Because, like, for instance, like in Germany, you know, like they've like they've institutionalized like a lot of systems, like an independent constitutional council, high threshold minimums in their parliament and other institutionalized mechanisms so that extremism will never again be allowed, that can be classified as a yeah. form of lawfare. Yeah. And uh, similarly, in like Rwanda, I mean, maybe it could also be debated that, you know, a lot of the institutions that they have are trying to sort of, you know, curtail certain tendencies in their culture and deal with the division of their population. Mm -hmm. So uh, would you say that it's all, yeah. can you comment about maybe some of the, Positive benefits of the institutions in in, in Rwanda that might also be classified as well. Yeah, v excellent question. Very very good. And and uh, you are absolutely right. I think I gave the impression um, that it was just negative. Even so, I made a statement to the contrary. But I think the examples I drew in were all very negative. This is a really good question because I believe you can wage lawfare for legitimate and illegitimate ends potentially. Um, and that's also even though I talk about the ICC in a negative sense, giving you one example of the Bashir. Uh, case, I do believe also, uh, I'm not a critic of international justice, uh, I find I have some problems with it, but I think overall it's a really good development. And I think there you'll see actually lawfare being waged in terms of the ICY, ICR, the IMT at Nuremberg, right? These were, I think, overall successful efforts uh, at reconstituting the foundations of international politics and society. Um, and uh, you absolutely right, the examples in Germany you mentioned as well. I think these are positive examples of lawfare. Um, Especially the Nuremberg trial, even though there, there are many problems, but I think this set in motion 
um, a positive development. And this was in lieu of war, right? And of course, as you know, the, the IMT at Nuremberg, the International Military Tribunal, from, for the trial of the major war criminals, uh, was pursued also uh, in lieu of an uh, uh, initial plan by Morgenthau to um, basically uh, de-industrialize Germany. This was one of the solutions being, being considered, right? So sort of to turn it into an agricultural country, to push it back in, in time, so it would be defeated. Um, all along, and this, this option wasn't pursued. So the defeat of the enemy came by way of legalism uh, <coughs> after the war was won, and I think this is a really positive account as well. And I think the ICC overall will have that effect as well. Um, in terms of one specific question, which I hadn't actually considered, but I, I will now, um, you certainly can make that argument, and I think this is important to, to um, in offering a nuanced discussion of Rwanda as well, because the, the one danger, something I do not want to say, say this is from the beginning all that, like a huge conspiracy theory. I, I don't think that really was going on. And I do believe that, that some, especially the young lawyers, um, if I can go back to that list, um, let me see. Um, were actually really interested, I think, in um, using the law for, for positive ends. Uh, I'm not sure where it is. Um, so you might say, say the Constitution, which is not all bad. I think there's some negative aspect of the Constitution. But you might say that there was an attempt of really turning the country into a, uh, a constitutional polity, right? And there was initially um, consultations around the country. Some critics said the consultations really weren't genuine. They already knew what they were going to do. But you might say that here, constitutionalism was taken seriously. You had all international experts in who consulted on these matters. And you might say, OK. And I would consider this under the rubric of, of actually lawmaking. Right? And that's what I, what I hope to get across as well. Not everything was necessarily part of the system of lawfare. There was a great deal in terms of creating the foundations for, um, say, investment. Right, so foreign direct investment, uh, creating the environment by way of law for, uh, for a thriving business community. I think in, in that instance, this was not lawfare. This was sort of law used in a, for given the country in a successful sense for affecting social regulation and creating the, the conditions for economic reform, political reform. Right? So you're absolutely right. <coughs> I wouldn't call that necessarily lawfare. Uh, because I think it, it sort of wasn't this integrated system, but I, I think it's, 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 it's important, as you pointed out, that we consider um, also some positive uh, outcomes of, of using the rule of law in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. um, you seem to have turned Clausewitz's uh, maxim on its head. Now, mm -hmm. now right. policy is the continuation of war by other means. Um, I just want to, uh, I'm not a big uh, Rwanda scholar, so. Uh, I wanted to know if uh, just how much the the Hutu militias uh, in as a threat, uh, since they were, they were based in North Congo mm -hmm. uh, after 1994, how much uh, of a threat were they, and how much of a motivation were they for this uh, for these uh, tribunals as a as a way of preventing more popular or. Uh, resistance against the Tutsi uh, minority government. When you tribunals, you mean the church? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, were they created with the potential, uh, the, the threat from from abroad in mind? Uh, was that part of the motivating factor for that, or was that? Uh, uh, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, It's hard to know. I mean, much of the, the, sort of the, the language that you heard from participants was you know, to affect reconciliation, to you know, create a stable peace, and so on. I, I haven't heard or seen anything where that was a particularly important objective, uh, but I bet it was on the mind of people as well. Sort of to, to, um, it probably was the hope that you could, you could create like a social fabric or reconstitute the social fabric and that that might then make it less likely um, that these, these insurgents, for example, would have collaborators inside the country. Um, but I haven't heard sort of people make this ex explicitly. I would imagine it's on people's minds. But on a different level, I think the, the, this is also important to appreciate that 
again, the, the regime did face a number of different threats from within and from without, right? And I think we do have, we do have to acknowledge this and take this very seriously. Um, you know, there was an onslaught from, from, from outside, especially in the Northwest, for a couple of years. And this was a really grave security concern. So as much as I'm critical, you can understand, you can relate to some of the choices that were being made. And I think they're still very short-sighted. Um, but the, the regime did face pressures on a number of different levels. And there were many, of course, still today, who, are, uh, who want to see it fail. And you also see this, um, like, there's many survivors who are you know, being killed. Um, there, was, there were two, two assassinations, one actually successful, one that failed outside of the Genocide Memorial Center in Kigali, for example. So you, you still have this underlying conflict there, and the question is whether the government <coughs> possess these are still genocidaires out there, they still want to destroy us. And of course it's a dynamic, we will never quite know how the dynamic played out, whether or not this violence <coughs> would have subsided had it not been for the repression um, of much of the Hutu population. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure if this answers your question. No, no, that's fine. Yes, on the floor. Um, I had a question about the involvement of women in these jurisdictions, because yeah. I know that Rwanda has, um, in their constitution, they have parameters set for female representation in parliament and cabinet. So I was wondering if anything like that took place in these jurisdictions. Um, there was no quota per se, but you do have many women serving in them for a number of different reasons. Um, one reason is that the minority, uh, Tutsi, of course, uh, most Tutsi men, or many Tutsi men were killed, so women became heads of households in many communities. Um, you know, most of the, the sort of Tutsi communities represented primarily by women, which accounts for the, the number of women on these tribunals as well. Uh, in my experience in Gishambu, for example, where I was, um, there was a very powerful female president of this jurisdiction as well. Um, you often have t women play um, sort of prominent roles. I don't have any data <coughs> to suggest any patterns or any particular, you know, uh, sort of women, is there a correlation between uh, female <coughs> participation uh, as judges and certain outcomes? I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but there wasn't a quota in the same sense. Uh, one thing also, we discussed this over dinner and yesterday, the role of women in Rwanda. And um, I'm personally a, a bit critical um, of this because you see this a lot in the same of times and elsewhere. Uh, the Rwanda is lauded for this achievement. And I think it is an important achievement um, and uh, to include women uh, in these, these polls and so on, and to, to have the parliament with the highest representation of women in the world. This is certainly remarkable. Uh, and I think this will have an effect. Uh, on gender relations in the country. Well, I'm skeptical, and some others, is whether or not this really is politically relevant in the foreseeable future. Because in, in my experience, women, parliamentarians and ministers and others, are outside of the sort of inner sanctum of power. Um, so women are not very influential politically. They're influential socially, very much so. Also in reconstructing certain communities uh, and often uh, affecting um, Sort of coexistence. There's a film that I think was a Drumble has shown and will show to some of you by Anne Amiens. She is a French filmmaker. She did a number of movies on these Kachacha jurisdictions in, in one community, you follow this community over a number of years, and you have many women <coughs> actually uh, sort of key protagonists in this film. Um, so, women, and there's a great deal of respect for women generally um, on the societal, social level. I don't think this really extends politically to many of them. <coughs> A way of excursus. Yes? Um, I guess a theoretical question about uh, Laka. Um, in a lot of the examples from Warren, you mentioned the presence of some sort of fear. And I was wondering about uh, what you see the relationship um, as between political fear and uh, Laka. Is it the fear? Could you elaborate, I think? Um, well, I guess political fear in terms of the use of fear as a means to achieve and deploy political power. Um, so I guess my thought here is the example of course of using this for creating this fear of the need to serve the people. I'm still not sure if I completely understand. So the role of fear in, in waging warfare? Or not yeah, something like that, yes. Um, in building on, for example, on Jewish Pitchbar's uh, liberalism yeah. and mm -hmm. such. In a more negative way, um, in the context of the representation of water. 
Mm-hmm. I haven't read that essay in, in, in quite a while, um, so I have to keep ignorant. Um, but I think, uh, sort of, to, to, I think, if I'm maybe I'm not answering your question, but I think fear does play a great deal, has a great part to play, I think, in persuading, at least in Rwanda, um, the waging of lawfare. I think it is the fear of a return of, of Hutu domination. Um, and I think it's the same fear that had, has caused the regime to wage war, of course, but for exploitative reasons, but also for preventive reasons, to prevent another genocide. So I think fear does motivate the use of lawfare. Um, and uh, I mean, it certainly instills fear as well, which in one of the is, is the, the principal objective as well, because fear has been in the past, fear of the same, but it has been an important motivator. Uh, for people to, to toe the line. I'm not quite sure if I'm really getting a question, but maybe you can come back and, and tell me how I can elaborate. Right, so I think, I mean, I'm thinking of it more as uh, a negative way, or a negative means of social control, yeah. in terms of, in discussion of, in terms of lawfare, the use of courts yeah. uh, as a way of imposing social control. And so I mean, whether in theory is the mechanism um, that in that context and what its effects might be on society. I see. Yeah, I think it's a good way of putting it. I think that's definitely the mechanism by which lawfare really works um, because it has a demonstration effect, essentially, right? Um, you want to create the impression that uh, a departure from, say, a government line could have, uh, you might incur a, a great deal of cost for this even. And I think the societal consequences we see already, and I think this is this goes back to the question that was asked previously what can be done now and I think because of, of this mechanism, because fear, it's a, it's a fear inducing institution if you will and I think because it has created a certain climate um, in society um, the, the repercussions are extremely negative, so above and beyond say the defeat of an enemy in, a, in an immediate context, it has more far reaching consequences, that is aimed at for example keeping this enemy down and I, I, see, I think we'll see this right now so I think the if, if you imagine uh, sort of Hutu participation, um, if you're moderate Hutu, if you will, not politically inclined, you'll probably see less and less incentives to participate um, because um, sort of the, the this climate of fear um, doesn't really yeah it doesn't really create incentives to participate or to to relate to this regime, which may then prompt you to respond uh, very very differently. So if you go to Hirschman, we discuss this earlier, in terms of exit and voice, I think. Uh, Albert Hirschman was an, is an economist, and, and he came up with this model of exit and voice, a hydraulic model. So his was about the uh, decline and respo- uh, responses and decline, uh, uh, response to decline in firms, states, or organizations. And he suggested essentially uh, you have two different ways of responding: voice or exit. Right? So you can either voice your complaints, say to a company, or you can protest if you were, for example, uh, responding to the client state, as happened in, in East Germany in the 80s, or you can simply leave the transaction. Um, and I think here in Rwanda, sort of the, to come back to your question, I think the fear uh, has discouraged the use of voice, fear in addition to this coercion. And I think in many respects, the only option left for many people is exit. And I argue that exit could either mean fleeing, and for the reasons I mentioned before, fleeing, leaving the country, is not that easy in Rwanda. So I think exit may take another form. You may exit, for example, internally, say like the internal emigration that you had uh, in Nazi Germany, <coughs> part of, of many who, who didn't you know, know how to oppose the regime, they emigrate internally. Or you might actually use exit in, in, uh, in the sense of just uh, responding violently. Uh, to this repression. Does it, does it help? Yes, well, it better help because <laughs> we're, we're basically out of time. Um, but I, I do want to throw out, I'm going to take the prerogative uh, and do two things. Uh, first, I want to ask a specific question. Um, I do have 30 seconds to answer. Is there a single example of an international criminal law institution or intervention that is not lawfare? And if not, then is the lawfare construct just almost truistically self-evident mm-hmm. at that level. So why don't you think about that, talk about it later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's give Yaks a break around.